Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the William F. Brace uh, lecture. Uh, and welcome also to our virtual audience who's out there. Uh, my name is Tim Grove. I'm a Oop, I'm running into that sign. I'm a professor uh, here in the Department of Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences, uh, also affectionately known as EAPS. Um, tonight's lecture is named in honor of Bill Brace. Um, he was a distinguished professor of rock physics at MIT and a, and a great colleague. We all miss him. Uh, he, he came to MIT in 1943 as a student and uh, ended up on the faculty and served here until 1988. If you want to know more about Bill and tonight's speaker, there's a, actually a nice little brochure that has all the details, but I want to keep this short so we can get right to the exciting talk that we're about to hear. Um, the Brace Lecture gives us an opportunity to sort of um, honor Bill's legacy and also to showcase um, our earth sciences in an engaging way. And so uh, that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, also, I wanted to shout out to Mrs. Peggy Brace, uh, who is virtually here along with several other members of the Brace family. Welcome to you. Um, so on to the main event. It's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Kirk Johnson. He is the SANT director of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History um, and takes care of lots of fossils and lots of other things, don't you, Kirk? <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, if you want to read in the brochure, you can hear, you can see all of his responsibilities and what he's doing there. Um, before, he was um, at the Smithsonian, he was at the Denver Museum of Natural History, and um, his education included uh, Amherst, I believe, and the University of Pennsylvania and Yale. So, Kirk, um, we're looking forward to what you have to say, and thanks for giving us the Brace Lecture. It's a real pleasure to be here. I spent four months at MIT in 2004 and really grew to uh, enjoy the staff and students at this place. And did several field trips around the American West with Sam Bowring, so it's a pleasure to be back. And I'm talking to you today about a topic that has been puzzling to me ever since it startled me about 35 years ago. And it's this concept that our planet has a history of warm poles. And we tend to think of the polar regions as icy and frigid as they are today. But the history of the planet says otherwise, that for the majority of the last half a billion years, the planet has had forested poles, not icy poles. And what I want to do in this talk is really give you the evidence I've seen over my career as a paleobotanist, uh, evidence for that statement, and uh, leave with you in the audience the challenge to figure out how do you keep poles warm enough in the winter when there's no solar uh, light reaching the poles for as much as three months. It's a big challenge, but I'm going to show you that they were warm and leave with the question of you figure it out, okay? So we move from there. Now, I'm a paleobotanist. There are very few of us in the world. Um, it means we've got a few hundred friends around the world, and um, I live and die by leaves. My family um, got me here. My father is uh, the son of a gardener, and just last weekend I was in um, Washington State with my dad, and there was this logging truck on the ferry with us, and I said, get next to the log, Dad. I want to take a picture of you next to the log. And, and when I took the picture, I realized, my goodness, I can count the rings in that log. And that log has 89 rings, and my dad has 85, right? So, <laughs> so one thing about trees, and this is really a talk about trees and ice when you get right down to it, because trees are these amazing things we take for granted. I'm going to try and um, bring you up to speed about why trees matter and, and why they're useful tools to understand the the planet's past. Now, my mom was a tree activist. There she is with my sister, dressed as a tree, <laughs> preventing trees from being cut down. So I have a, a long history as a tree person. And I want to just uh, give you a little quick tree primer here. Uh, there are, most of the trees in the world are either broadleaf flowering plants or conifers. So this is an example of a broadleaf flowering plant, Cercidophyllum, the Japanese katsura it's called. You can see it has broad leaves. Broadleaf trees can be either deciduous or evergreen. 
A lot of times you think evergreens are conifers, but broadleaf trees can be either deciduous or evergreen. They can drop their leaves or they can keep them all year long. There are also conifers. Here's an example of a conifer, metasequoia, the Don Redwood. Conifers can also be either deciduous or evergreen. So some people get confused and think evergreens are conifers, and deciduous trees are broadleaf trees, but both can be um, both deciduous or evergreen. That's important when we start thinking about how trees respond to winter because when you're deciduous, you drop your needles or leaves in the winter because the winter is not worth the trouble of keeping your needles and leaves on the trees. So good to know. And note that both of these have nice fossil records. Now, one thing that's really cool about trees is there's a recent paper in Science talking about how many trees are there on planet Earth today. And they did an exhaustive survey and came up with an estimate of 3.04 trillion trees on planet Earth today. That means that if a planet has 7.6 billion people, there are basically 400 trees per person on planet Earth today. That number is a startlingly high number to me, but when you walk in a forest and count trees, there's a lot of trees out there. And the, um, if you think about it, it, they estimate that the, the number of trees on the Earth has gone down by about 45% since, uh, since civilization started. So we're, as a species, we're uh, sort of very aggressively deforesting. We're cutting down about 15 billion trees a year globally. So it's a pretty impressive number. Um, there are 60,000 tree species on the planet right now. 60,000 different species of trees. So when someone hands you a piece of wood and says, what kind of wood is it? That's a tremendously difficult question to answer. Or if they hand a leaf to you, it's the same thing. And the final point I want to make about trees is that they're Species, there are many, there's over um, almost 400,000 species of plants on the planet. But if you take one notch back and talk about the genera, the generic level, say elms, maples, oaks, many, many, many species have lasted longer than 50 million years, which is a startling observation if you think about it. They have been around, they're very persistent. Tree Generic evolution is a very slow process and general last a very long time. In some cases, something like the ginkgo has lasted 150 million years. So these are very long-lived um, lineages and they, um, they are much more mobile than you would think. I mean, trees move across the landscapes fairly rapidly as their leaves uh, and their seeds get blown across the landscape or they get moved by birds. So trees can migrate just like animals can migrate. And this map shows the distribution of trees on planet Earth today. And there's a couple things to be said about that. There's sort of this big swath of the boreal forest running across the northern tier, the spruce moose ecosystem. There's the bands of tropical rainforests in the equatorial regions. Little pockets of temperate deciduous forest here and here and there. And then miscellaneous uh, coastal forests, conifer coastal forests. So it's, there's a very distinct distribution of trees in the planet today because trees grow where there is ample moisture. If you don't have enough moisture, you can't grow a tree. In low moisture areas, you get things like scrublands, deserts, or in places where the ground is frozen, Arctic tundra. So that's the map looks the way it does, is trees actually reflect the two things. They reflect the local ecology, but since trees are basically the solid form of carbon dioxide gas, they're made out of CO2, they're in equilibrium with the climate and the actual global um, atmosphere as well. So trees are pretty interesting. They, they move around based on very specific local climate tolerances, and they take advantage of the CO2 in the atmosphere, and they're very good little weather gauges. They're also fabulous carbon fixation devices. That's what they are. They basically fix carbon. And if you bury a tree and get coal, you've buried your carbon. If you burn the coal, you put the carbon back up in the atmosphere. Um, the 60,000 species is a problem as a paleobotanist, and we spent almost a decade working on the manual of leaf architecture to use the vein patterns to be able to describe different species of leaves. And the vein patterns are basically the water delivery mechanism that brings water from the roots up the vascular system of the tree out to the leaf where it's used with the carbon dioxide gas coming in through the stomata to run the photosynthetic engine of plants. And you would think that the leaf veins would be convergent and similar, but in fact, they're sort of like the fingerprints on, on criminals. They're different from tree species to tree species. And we spent a decade, a bunch of us botanists spent a decade trying to figure out how do you describe consistently and uniformly the veination patterns of leaves. So 
I know that you do this as uh, people who live in a forest. I'm going to give you a test now. I'm going to show you seven leaves. Look at it and see if you recognize it. You probably recognize this one. You can yell it out if you recognize it. Good, OK. How about this one? Oak, you got that one. How about this one? Linden? I hear a linden out there. Got a linden. How about this one? Think a uh, Linzer tort. It's a hazelnut. How about that one? Poplar. Great. How about that one? Larch, hemlock, great. You guys are doing well. How about that one? Blackberry, bingo. Okay, you guys are pretty good. Where is this forest? It's here, right? No, it's in Harbin in China. This is one of the great surprises that um, greeted plant explorers in the 1600s when they left Europe in search of new places. They landed on the shores of Eastern North America and found the trees of Eastern North America were very similar at the generic level to the trees of Europe. They were much more surprised to land on the shores of Eastern Asia and go into places like Japan and Manchuria, Northern China, and find the exact same species there as well. And this is one of the great early mysteries of plant biology that was uh, the Arnold Arboretum here in the, in the Boston was very instrumental in sort of working on this thing, this discovery that there are three patches of northern hemisphere temperate deciduous forest, and the species composition is quite similar. It's weird because how do you do that? How do you have the same forest divided into three parts? It turns out that the European forest is the least species rich, the North American is the second richest in species, and the Asian one is the most rich in species. But by and large, if you know the forest of Boston, you can walk around in Manchuria and recognize all the trees. It's a very fun, cool thing, but you're left with a question like, how did that happen? How did the world end up with three patches of a once continuous forest so widely separated by the steppes of Asia, the North Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean? How did that happen? It's a, it's a big puzzle. It's called the disjunct flora. And of course, I will be giving you the answer later in the talk. But it's, it's really one of those things that I find compelling, because this is your world, and yet very few people have been to Manchuria. And when you go to Europe, you don't think about it. You kind of expect to see the same trees there. But really, there's no reason why you should. We're on different continents. So these three disjunct um, areas are somewhat confusing. And, and people at the Arnold Arboretum would travel to China because they would find varieties of the trees they were familiar with, different kinds of cherries. You look at the, China, the Japanese maple, for instance, really different cool varieties. They'd bring them back, and they'd sell them at nurseries. It was a very profitable business to do that. The two trees that I showed you, the metasequoia conifer, that was discovered only in 1941 in Hupei in China. It was brought back and planted all over the place. They're here in Boston in 1948. Um, those trees we find as fossils in North America. The ginkgo, which grows native in Korea and China, those trees we find as fossils in North America. So in some senses, those, those nursery trees that were brought back from Asia were the return of the native. There were trees that had been living in North America, went extinct, then been brought back. A different kind of tree. Ignore the beer in the foreground. <laughs> this is Panama at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Um, the tree in the background is a palm tree. And you associate palm trees with drinking beer on the beach, which is appropriate because um, that's what you do when you see a palm tree. It's sort of a Pavlovian dog response. <laughs> there are about 2,000 species of palm trees in the world. And they come in many forms and shapes. Some are smaller bushes, some are tall trees. Um, these are all different kinds of palms, um, different kinds of palms a whole variety of different forms of palms. The interesting thing about palm trees is they are a tree that really can't take frozen ground at all. So the global distribution of palms looks like this. That's why you associate palms with beaches and beers, because you usually find them in either um, tropical areas or tropical desert areas, the palm trees in Sierra. So the fact that we have palm trees in North America is that you can see them pretty much in California or Florida, but you're not going to see them here in Massachusetts because we have days like yesterday when it would be uncomfortable to be a palm tree. 
So palm trees are climate indicators of never frozen ground. Thank you very much. And of course, palms fossilize nicely. So these, these, these plants have been around for a long time. They fossilize nicely. Their climate data monitors, they begin to start telling you the story of the planet. There's a group of plants, a little bit more obscure, called the cycads. You usually see these things only in botanic gardens. They really don't like cold weather. There's only 350 species of cycads. They're quite beautiful things. They look kind of like palms, but they are not flowering plants. Palms are flowering plants. Cycads are seed plants. And they fossilize quite nicely, thank you very much. And they're just a little bit like palms in the distribution. Pretty much tropical, sometimes in the deserts. So broadleafs, conifers, palms, cycads, those are kind of the things that are gonna move around the continent for you and uh, build up. And then of course, there are tropical rainforests. And if you've ever been to a tropical rainforest, that, that green hell of trunks, there's lots of palm trees in the rainforest, but usually when you walk into a rainforest, you don't see much but lots of stems and way up on the top of the canopy are leaves that are hard to see. It turns out that tropical rainforests have a very distinctive feature. Most of the leaves have this very elongate tip on them. It's called a drip tip. And the reason for the drip tip is that in tropical rainforests, everwet rainforests, it rains a lot. By definition, more than 60, 70 inches a year, up to a couple hundred inches of rain a year. And if you are a tree, your leaf's job is to actually photosynthesize. You take in gas, and you take sun in the top of the leaf, gas in from the bottom of the leaf, and you do the photosynthetic work of the plant. In a wet tropical rainforest, if the surface of the leaf is wet, it doesn't matter to the plant. It wants to get the water from its roots, not from the leaf. If it's wet, algae and fungus will grow on the leaf surface and block the photoreceptors of the leaf, and tropical rainforest plants don't want to have their leaves blocked from the sun. So they want their leaves to be dry. And the way they dry their leaves is by having a drip tip. And if you ever watch these things in operation, when it rains in a tropical rainforest, the very first thing to dry will be the surface of tropical rainforest leaves. They drip dry almost immediately. The waxy surface and the, and the water drops build on top of those drip tips and drip off. And the leaf drips off. And uh, if you walk around in a tropical rainforest and collect the forest trees, you find that almost all of the trees are oval and have drip tips. It's a strong convergence to life in a very wet and rainy place. And of course, um, Wet, rainy places also allow leaves to get very large. So here's the largest leaf in the world, with me as scale. Um, it's quite a big, and a tree like this, you don't need many leaves, actually, right? Because you get your photosynthetic surface on these bedspread size kind of um, leaves. And of course, drip tips fossilize as well. So you can recognize tropical rainforests when you find the fossil drip tips. So what's cool about plants is you can actually start to pull this whole picture together. Now, I mentioned crocodiles um, and alligators and caiman. They're fun to catch if you are um, good about the right size that you're trying to catch. That's a very important fact. This is about the maximum size you can catch and have a good time with. But um, <laughs> alligators and turtles are kind of like palms and cycads. They live in places where freezing is not really great for them. They're pretty abundant in tropical and subtropical places and occasional creep north into areas. But by and large, crocodiles and turtles are the animal equivalents to palms and cycads. And they make great fossils as well for the reason that they live in depositional environments. When I mean, they live in streams and ponds, when they die, they get buried, they become great fossils. And here's a modern alligator skull and a fossil alligator skull. The alligator skull on that side, the little guy is from Colorado. So we had alligators in Colorado at one point in time. Turtles are even better because not only do they live in the depositional environment, but they're actually wearing their own coffin, right? A turtle shell is like a coffin. So they're, they're in their own coffin living in their own graveyard. And turtle fossils are almost the most common fossils in the entire animal world. I mean, you, if you're looking for fossils, you will find fossil turtles. Don't be impressed with yourself. Everybody <laughs> finds turtles. There are thousands and millions of fossil turtles because they live and die in their depositional landscape. All right, let's look a little bit at the climate. This is a, a curve that Dana Royer published in 2004. And what's so compelling about this curve is it shows the last 600 million years of planet Earth. And in the lower graph of the blue bars show the times in which there were polar ice caps. And the height of the bar is referred to the latitude to which the polar ice descended during the maximum ice extent. So you can see that at peak um, ice extent around 300 million years ago, ice came down to latitude 40. And in that, that band, in 300 million years ago, there was a 
big land mass on the South Pole, but there was no land at the North Pole, so it was a unipolar ice cap. There were no ice caps in the North Pole in the Permian, or the, the Permian uh, Carboniferous Ice Age because there was no land to put them on. By the time you get that next surge of ice starting at around 25, 30 million years ago to the present, you have enough land near the North Pole that you get ice caps on Greenland and ice caps on Antarctica. You have bipolar ice in that second phase. And you can see a few smaller ice, um, ice periods. But the key thing to note there is that for most of the last five or 600 million years of Earth history, there has not been ice at the poles. You take it for granted. I mean, you're taught that the sun strikes the middle of the Earth, warms it up, it's really cold at the edges of the Earth, it's hot in the middle, it's cold at the edge, sometimes, but not all the time. In fact, about 15% of the time, we have polar ice, and about 85% of the time, we don't. That's a very interesting pattern. Of course, the top graph gives you the reason for that, and that's our best estimates at the concentration of carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere. And you can see when carbon dioxide gas is high, the poles don't have ice. When it's low, the poles have ice. So when your carbon is in the air, you have, you have the forest of the poles, and when your carbon is in the ground, you have the ice of the poles. So really, the history of our planet is Ice house or greenhouse, or ice house or hot house. Ice world, hot house world. Or forest world and ice world. And as a paleobotanist who spent my time working on rocks between the ages of 50 and 100 million years, I've spent almost my entire life digging up evidence of the hot house world. And I find our present world wholly anomalous. If you look at this curve, which shows the last 70 million years from Jim Zakos' uh, 2001 paper, and you've got warm to the right and cold to the left, there is the most recent ice ages here the last two and a half million years. You can see this is the thermal maximum of the, Pale or the early Eocene. Here's the Paleocene Eocene thermal um, peak. So you have a very warm world that starts to cool, and at about 34 million years, you get a sharp drop. This is when Antarctic ice starts to grow, and sometimes later, Arctic ice starts to grow. So for the last 35 million years, we've been in an ice house world. And of course, the big question is, as we add carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, will we go back to a greenhouse world? Will we jump back to this time period? We've done some estimates on uh, CO2 back in this time frame. There was one that was just published, or actually in press, from one of the forests we have right here. Parts per million CO2, 600. Be cooler or could be less. Today, parts per million CO2 is about 410 parts per million. When I was born, it was about 315 parts per million. So during the course of my life, the 57 years of my life, we've seen carbon dioxide concentrations go from 315 to 410. 25% increase in an atmospheric gas concentration in my lifespan. Worth taking note of, especially when the state between ice house and greenhouse seems to be in the range of what would happen if we would burn all our fossil fuel resources. So if you look at our world today, that's what it looks like. And I had a map of North America on my wall for a long time when I was a young geologist. And one day, I don't know why, it dawned on me that I was looking at the footprint of the last ice age. Hudson's Bay is where the ice cap sat, and it depressed Hudson's Bay. And this, this great thing is the footprint of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which sat here multiple times in the past most recently about 18,000 years ago. Had we been sitting in this room 18,000 years ago, there would have been a couple thousand feet of ice above our heads, which would be inconvenient at least. Um, and I grew up in Seattle when they were building the Space Needle. Here's a rare shot of the Space Needle in construction, missing its top. Space Needle as it stands today is 603 feet tall. 18,000 years ago, there were 3,000 feet of ice on top of Seattle, so five Space Needles of ice in Seattle. 18,000 years ago is not that long, when you think about it. It's like five times the pyramids or something like that. It's just like, it's only twice human civilization. So something happened between 18,000 years ago and the beginning of civilization that removed all that ice from the mid-latitudes and it retreated back. But I'm more interested in this time period. This is North America 60 million years ago. This is ice-free North America at a time well before there was Antarctic ice sheets and Arctic ice sheets. And the question I have is, what did that look like? What was it like if you were here 60 million years ago in uh, 
Paleocene North America. You can see that the continents aren't exactly the range the way they are today because of the great um, grinding movements of plate tectonics and the arrival of exotic terrains. But you can basically make out the general shape. The Western Interior Seaway had retreated, and you can see here's uh, the southern end of it and the northern end up here. There was this wonderful moment, you know, this, when you have a narrow strip of land between two bodies of water, we call it an isthmus, like the Isthmus of Panama. There was a point when we had the Isthmus of North Dakota. <laughs> Just ponder that for a second. So here is this amazing landmass, our North America, 60 million years ago. And um, here's what the polar regions look like today. And if you look at this map, there are three lines. There is the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle is that point above which on the longest day of the year, the sun doesn't set for one day. And as you go towards the pole, the length of polar light increases. And at the North Pole, the year is one day long. The sun comes up for six months, goes down for six months. And if you go to a place like Ellesmere Island, you have, in the summer, three to four months of complete sun. The sun just goes around in the sky like this. It's super amazing to watch it. I've spent about 16 weeks up in Ellesmere Island. You can just, if you know which direction north is, which is a problem because the magnetic north pole is down here, and you're here, so your compass points to the southwest. But if you do know which way north is, then the sun is its own sundial. It just goes around in a circle, and you know exactly what time it is. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Second line is the solid line, here, the, this one. That's the 10 degree isotherm. That is the, if the temperature in July averages 50 degrees more or less. So below the line, the average temperature in July is more than 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and above it, it's less. And you'll note that the dotted line, which is the modern day tree line, hangs pretty close to the, 50, the 10 degree or 50 degree isotherm. So basically, trees don't grow north of that level because of the temperature, cool temperatures in July. So I, early in my career, when I was 24, I had two amazing opportunities to go to the Arctic um, for entire summers with uh, a small expedition of four people to look for fossils in the high Arctic to start to poke at these questions. What was the Arctic like 60 million years ago? And it was an amazing, amazing thing. And, and these are places that I long to go back to. Um, Ellesmere Island is this one. It's the size of uh, England. And Axel Heiberg is the size of Ireland. Axel Heiberg is uninhabited. On Ellesmere, there's one small um, Inupiat village here at, at Greece Fjord. There's a weather station there. And there's some lonely Royal Canadian Mounted Police up there. And that's it. There's about 180 people living on a landmass the size of England. Amazing place. On it are ice caps. There's Greenland. And there's several ice caps on Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg. And these orange patches are sedimentary rocks that are about 60 million years old. So to answer the question, what did it look like 60 million years ago, you go to those orange patches. And we spent two glorious summers marching around in those patches. We load up our gear to Twin Otter. We fly over the um, very active ice glaciers and land on this spectacular tree-free landscape of Ellesmere. There's really, I mean, that's the vegetation. You're looking at it. Um, we'd, and uh, we would view these incredible ice caps. This is like the ice sheet that sits on top of, of Greenland. This is a several thousand foot thick ice cap. And it's hard to see scale, but there's a 300 foot high waterfall right there. And there I am in a younger state at the foot of that thing. So what's very cool is by going up there now, it's like going back to the Pleistocene, back to the Ice Age. But we weren't going to go to the Ice House Earth. We were going to visit the Greenhouse Earth. And here was our lovely home on Stenkel Fjord. This fjord stays frozen all year round. It doesn't, doesn't melt down in the summer at all. It's just a nice, it's a frozen saltwater fjord. There's our little village. And there's the rest of our noble team. Led by this woman, Mary Dawson. Mary Dawson is a Carnegie Museum of um, Pittsburgh expert on fossil mammals. And she was the first person to discover pre-Ice Age fossil mammals north of the Arctic Circle. She was testing her hypothesis. And she, in 1977, she went to the Arctic. The first fossil she found was not a mammal, though. It was a fossil alligator. That caused her some concern, because we're like 1,800 miles north of the Arctic Circle and a long way from the nearest alligator. The only woody tree, and I'm not going to call this a tree, really, but the only woody plant on Ellesmere Island is the Arctic willow. And there it is. That's as tall as they get. They get about an inch and a half tall. 
Um, if you cut one of these things down, you can get 300 growth rings out of it. A pencil thick stem will give you 300 growth rings. The growing season here sort of starts in July, and then by late July, the, the foliage turns color and it drops to the ground, half inch. <laughs> so here's autumn in the Arctic, which happens in the third week of July, and the foliage drops. It's your New England foliage translocated north. But we were there for the fossils. And this place is amazing because there's effectively no vegetation covering the rocks in this island. It is a pure geology paradise. And there's incredible outcrops where you see sort of textbook examples. And amazing things, because as a Paleocene paleobotanist, I spent a lot of time in the coal mines of Wyoming, the big lines near Gillette where the coal seams are 80 feet thick. It's a mystery how you get an 80 foot thick coal seam. Here on Ellesmere Island, a thousand miles north of the Arctic Circle is a 120 foot thick coal seam. Ponder that, a Paleocene coal seam that's thicker than the coal mines in Wyoming. It's permafrost, I mean here the permafrost goes down well over a thousand meters. So that's a frozen coal. And we fly around in choppers and there's coal seams everywhere. When you land at those coal seams, these little crumbled piles of rock are actually fossilized logs with the growth rings on them. And they're big logs and stumps, and you find actually standing petrified forests. In places you find trees that are four and five feet in diameter with several hundred growth rings. When you poke around the base of these things, you find the leaves that fell off of those trees. And miraculously, this leaf is the Don Redwood, Meta Square, the same one that was discovered in Hupei in China in 1941. It's planted here on the grounds of MIT was living here in swamps well north of the Arctic Circle 60 million years ago. This is a swamp tree from warm temperate China, happily growing in dense forests in the Arctic. Here is that Katsura tree I showed you, the scholar tree, the Chinese tree. Now remember that tree used to have fossils in North America. Now they're in the Arctic, they live in China. And you realize those three disjunct forests I show you were all just one forest that has been severed by the cooling climate that's made forests impossible at high latitudes and left three dangling deciduous temperate forest regimes, one in East Asia, one in Eastern North America, and one in Europe. Here's an elm. Here's a birch. This one's tricky. It's a lotus. Arctic lotuses. Now, Mary Dawson was an amazing woman. That's her on her knees. That's a typical vertebrate paleontology posture. <laughs> they crawl around all day long looking for little tiny teeth. And she found crocodiles and turtles, things you would not predict, but they are sort of those warm climate indicators high above the Arctic Circle. But she found other amazing things. Here's a complete skull of a fossil mammal. You can see the teeth. You're looking into the roof of the mouth, there's a row of teeth. And for mammals, um, the teeth are quite distinctive. If you give a vertebrate paleontologist a mammal tooth, they can tell you which mammal it came from. It's one of the most um, interesting and useless skills they have, but <laughs> I mean, it, you play it. And, and there are, in fact, many vertebrate paleontologists who do their entire careers working only on isolated teeth. They'll crawl around, they'll find teeth that are a millimeter and a half long, and they can look at that tooth and figure out which animal it's from and reconstruct a fauna from a bunch of little tiny teeth. In this case, they've got the entire skull. This is an animal called a flying lemur, which today lives in the forests of, of Indonesia. So somehow you have a subtropical forest animal up in the high Arctic in this warm Arctic world. And here's a diorama that we did for the American Museum's Extreme Mammals uh, exhibit that's traveling around the country of a Paleocene forest from Ellesmere Island. You can see the trees and the lotus. This big animal is an animal called Corypidon, which is an Eocene mammal that lived around 55 to 65 million years ago. Here's an artist rendering of that landscape. Again, um, the big trees, the crocodiles, the lotuses, the turtles, the yearly horses, the running rhinos. It's a rich and lush forest landscape all the way up to the tip of the Arctic Ocean. Not at all expected, and it blew my mind as a 24-year-old to go to the Arctic and first get my mind blown by the Arctic, and then get my mind blown by the un by the warm Arctic. 
2005, they published a paper based on a deep sea drilling project that drilled in the middle of the Arctic um, base, Arctic Basin, and they drilled down to the Lomonosov Ridge and brought up cores of rock that were 47 to 48 million years old, expecting to find the fossils of marine plankton that settled to the bottom of the Arctic seafloor, and from those plankton derive paleo temperatures to understand the temperature of the Arctic Ocean in the warm period. What they found was amazing. They found several sections of the core where there were no forams at all, but in fact there were fern spores. And there's a fern called Azola, and here's what the Arctic Ocean would have looked like at this time. It was more of a closed base, and Europe was closer to Greenland. It's possible the Bering Land Bridge is connected. It's almost an entirely closed basin. What they found was this fern called Azola, which looks like this. They're little tiny floating ferns. And if you want to go to see an Azola today, you can go down to New Orleans and drive around in the marshes and see it. But the best places to see Azola is in the Amazon basin. Here's a picture I took in the Amazon on a giant lake. That's a lake totally covered with floating fern Azola. Blink your eyes, and you're looking at the Arctic Ocean 50 million years ago. Not covered by floating sea ice, but covered by floating fern mats. Now, this is a plant that doesn't grow in the salt water, so how do you get fresh water in the Arctic Basin? It's a closed basin, you have a warm climate, you have runoff, and you embed a lens of fresh water on top of the Arctic salty water down below. So you have this freshwater lake floating on a saltwater ocean covered with freshwater ferns in a place where today you have rapidly melting Arctic sea ice. I went on to do a career of fossil leaves, and I kept surprising myself by finding things that just blew my mind. And one of the great things about working in a museum is that basically people call you when they find cool stuff. And one guy called me and said, hey, I'm down here on the side of Interstate 25 in Castle Rock, Colorado, 25 miles from my office, and I found something pretty cool. We're doing some road widening, and we found fossil palm fronds. I said, that's pretty neat. So I went down there, and there were gigantic leaves there. And there were cycads. And many of the leaves had drip tips. It was like the first really good bit of evidence anywhere in the world of a Paleocene tropical rainforest in Colorado, up against the Rocky Mountains. Probably the water was coming off the Gulf of Mexico and up against the newly uplifted Rockies and creating an orographic effect in high rainfall. But here's Colorado, warm, wet, tropical rainforest, 20 miles from my office at the Denver Museum published in Science in 2002. When I did the work in Colorado, I was looking and a lot of the species we found in that rainforest in Colorado were undescribed and unpublished species, but I did find that the cycad and a couple of the species had been written about in a 1936 paper by a geologist who'd been working on the coast of Alaska. So many years later, I hired a boat in Sitka and went into the inland archipelago of the Alaskan coast to Kupernoff Island, and we tried to locate the site. And here we are. You can only collect here at low tide because the tide covers the beach. But at low tide, we were breaking in open racks and slabs and seeing what we could find. And we were um, cracking open layers, hunting for fossils. Met a sequoia, no surprise but then tropical rainforest-like leaves, now in Alaska, drip tips even, cycads. Remember, these are things that are pretty much confined to the tropics. We came back a year later when we were making the, the Nova film, Making North America, because so I thought this would be a cool place to bring a camera crew, and we had not as much luck this time. We were there filming, the tide was coming up, we were kind of running out of time, and I was just like, I had three guys at Crowbar. It's like, pop rocks. We've got an expensive crown film crew here. We've got to get some footage. And much to my amazement, and genuinely live on camera, with about 10 minutes before the tide was there, we popped open a slab of rock, and it had a gigantic palm frond on it. I mean, a gigantic palm frond. And here we are, like latitude now, 56. And we've got palms. So here, this palm frond is going together back in the lab. It's, um, we have one more chunk that fits on this side. It's seven feet wide. It's the kind of thing you would see if you went to a place where you could drink beer on the beach. Not what you associate with Alaska. Thus, it sounds so strange. I mean, really, two words juxtaposed. Alaskan palm. That says something about a warm world. 
And here's a reconstruction of Southeast Alaska. So I started saying well, to myself, you know, what's going on with that? And I, I, I had read about a place in Washington State which also had fossil palms um, near Bellingham, gigantic rainforest leaves. Then I talked to a guy who had been working up in the Matanuska Valley north of Anchorage, and he said, I think I found a fossil palm. I said, let's go look at it, and this is in 2012. We went up the road, and there's a place called the Chickaloon Formation, which has broad leaves and met a sequoia, but we got to this road cut, and way up the road cut, there was a thing that looked like a palm, and we used this device called an Alaskan climbing stick, <laughs> where you lean the stick, it's a near vertical outcrop, and we were like desperate to see if there's a palm up there, and um, I had to use two of them due to my massive um, bulk, but um, this is Pat Druckenmiller from the University of Alaska Fairbanks climbing up the climbing stick, and right there is the northernmost known palm frond ever found at latitude 61. So here you got a palm frond at latitude 61 when today they're afraid to get out of place where the ground freezes. The pattern starts to emerge of a coastal wet subtropical rainforest stretching from Seattle up the coast all the way to um, Anchorage. Now, there are other pieces. And like, paleontology is a funny thing because little pieces emerge and fill part of the story. At the Denver Museum, I was um, visited by a gentleman who had found an amazing fossil. He'd held it his whole life. He came in to visit me when he was 85. He said, I'm giving you my prized fossil. It was a giant fossil ant. Now, you know, we're in E.O. Wilson country here, so what does giant mean? Well, let's use a hummingbird for scale. It was a giant ant. I didn't know there was such a thing as giant ants, and it turns out that in the wet tropics, there's a certain family of giant ants that are distributed right in the tropics. So here we have this giant ant from Wyoming. So another evidence of warm tropical conditions in Wyoming in the Eocene. And then just this September, I was in, in Anchorage opening an exhibit in the Anchorage Museum, and I met this young gentleman. His name is Kai. He's four years old. He was walking on the beach in Homer, Alaska with his grandmother in July. And his grandmother some years ago had found part of a mammoth tusk. She was very keen to look for fossils. And she had trained young four-year-old Kai how to find fossils. And he picked up this rock and he said, Grandma, what's this? And it was, believe it or not, the first pre-Pleistocene fossil mammal ever found in Alaska. This four-year-old kid found it last summer. <laughs> but the amazing thing was it was a taper. So you know where tapers live, they live in Costa Rica and Brazil and Indonesia, and here is Ty's taper from Homer, Alaska. So the picture begins to just keep emerging and growing on itself, and I'll take you briefly to the southern hemisphere before letting you ask questions, but if you go to the southern hemisphere, it's sort of a different story. You have the tip of South America, the horrible Drake's Passage if you've ever gone to the Antarctic Peninsula, over here, Australia. New Zealand, the island state of Tasmania. And these reddish blobs are the distribution of a tree called Nothophagus. And it's sort of funny, because when you're here, it's almost 5,000 miles across to there. It's the same tree. So if you go to, um, this is a picture of a place in Chile. It looks an awful lot like the place in New Zealand. And if you compare the leaves from Chile to the leaves from New Zealand, you're like, wow, this is the same place. Or here's Coriaria from New Zealand, and here's Coriaria from Chile. So it's just like that disjunct you see in the northern hemisphere where the trees from eastern North America and eastern Asia are mimicked in the southern hemisphere where Chile and New Zealand have the same vegetation today. How do you do it with Antarctica in the middle? Well, it turns out that it was a pretty big question. And we started working in Patagonia in 1991 in a place on the Chubut River here up from Trileo. And we found this remarkable site. It's um, a volcanic caldera with beautiful white lake beds. And it has the most exquisite fossils. It had been discovered in the 20s. And someone had gone through and, and really just noted it was there. I came back like 70 years later. And when I got there, I walked up the hill. And there were just exquisite fossil plants just lying around at the surface. And I was like, this is amazing. Because here's a very clearly a beautiful fossil, started digging into it. And I had just finished a postdoc doing research in the Australian rainforests. And I was stunned to find, as we dug into this rock and started collecting fossils, that we were finding things that I'd seen in Australia. So here's a fossil leaf from this quarry from Patagonia. Here's the living thing from northern Australia and the fossil thing from southern Australia. 
So now we were seeing not just temperate continuity across Antarctica, but warm temperate to tropical continuity, just like we're seeing in the north. We found a conifer there that grows today in New Guinea, in the rainforest of New Guinea. We found a podocarp that grows in the rainforest of Southeast Asia. And we found this leaf, which is a very distinctive vein pattern. If you've ever been to California and seen eucalyptus trees, they have a very distinctive pattern. Here's a eucalyptus in Australia, and Australians are very proud of the eucalyptus trees. There's over 700 species of eucalyptus that live only in Australia and New Guinea. So there's their distribution of eucalyptus today. We're located over here. We found fossil eucalyptus. Not only the leaves, I mean, here is a modern clear leaf, and here's our fossil leaf, but we actually found the fruits and the flowers of eucalyptus. And our fossils were older than the oldest eucalyptus fossils in Australia. Think how much that annoyed them. <laughs> but even better than my Patagonian colleagues. And so here you're seeing the pattern, right? Here's this connection. But this is right on the South Pole. You've got to get tropical stuff across that thing to make it work. My, my colleagues in Patagonia found the Patagonian platypus. Now, this is, in, no, this is the Australian Geographic whose logo is the platypus. And I, 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 have you ever seen an, a duck-billed platypus? When I saw one in the wild for the first time, I was tremendously disappointed because I expected a beaver-sized animal. But platypus is like this big. It's a gigantic letdown. <laughs> right? You're like, what, that's a platypus? Give me a break. The Patagonian platypus is beaver-sized. So two strikes against the poor Australians because they're two of their major iconic organisms are Patagonian first. But they speak to this transpolar warming. And to wrap it up, I present to you the Paleocene world, which has got temperate forests all the way to the poles. It's got multiple bands of tropical rainforests separated by the dry areas of the horse latitudes. And my guess for the number of trees on this planet is probably like 10 trillion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk, for a mm -hmm. fascinating talk about a far, far away world. Uh, would anybody like to ask our speaker some questions? Yes, I'm wondering about the coastal I have a question regarding the coastal palms found in Alaska. Um, has there been exploration into the interior, and could could there be palms found in there? Is the, I guess the reason where the, pa the palms found there, is it because there was more exploration of that on the coast? Or <coughs> does the forest likely have that shape that was only along the coast? Well, that's a good question. There's really only, I mean, this whole exploration of the palms has sort of been a hobby for me since I became the director of the museum. So normally I'm doing museum stuff, and I occasionally sneak away and make some TV or uh, visit my friends in Alaska. So I've slowly been piecing this together. The literature shows fossil palm sites mainly in that strip that you see. But there's no good Paleocene outcrops further inland to test that hypothesis. Palms do have somewhat distinctive pollen grains. And there have been some reports of fossil palm pollen from northern Canada as well. But I think it's, it's an open question whether these were a coastal species and they maybe were getting warm water off the North Pacific when the North Pacific was warm, as opposed to being inland. It's an open question, a good one. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, this, I'm going to stand on my tiptoes. Excellent. <laughs> Um, so I was thinking about what you mentioned earlier about ginkgo that's been around for 150 million years, so basically in the same shape, right? Like mm -hmm. pretty much the same plant. Um, and then also all of these tremendous climate changes that have happened in that time period. And I was curious about like what allows a tree like the, the ginkgo to survive in basically the same form for so long. Like what, what characteristics do these trees have that have lasted so long um, through so many different conditions? Well, it's a really excellent question. I mean, if you look at how long a mammal species lasts, a mammal species lasts about a million years, more or less, and a mammal genera a little bit more, but animals are a different kind of organism than our 
plants. I find as a museum person that I continually run into people who don't even think that trees are alive. Well, they're not animals, right? They're not alive. So I mean, they, they have a different kind of biology, and for whatever reason, that seems to make them relatively conservative in terms of their evolution. But with 60,000 species of trees, they're clearly evolving too. And you know, for all of the evidence we have from the fossil record, um, we are still fairly challenged to understand the specifics of plant evolution because when plants die, they fall apart. So like, you know, you, a leaf will fall off, the cone will fall off, and when you find all these parts, it's like Humpty Dumpty, you have to put them back together again. And so it's very difficult to reconstruct an ancient whole plant, and you need that ancient whole plant if you can identify it based on its morphology. The leaves help a little bit, but we very typically find a bunch of fossil flowers, a bunch of fossil leaves, a bunch of fossil seeds, a bunch of fossil wood, and you're like, huh, how many species is this? So I would say I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> Hi. So, so you argued pretty persuasively that things were a lot warmer at the poles in the, in the past, but it was still, you know, very long days and during the summer and very short days yeah. during the night. And yet you're finding analogs to plants that live in the tropics where it's 12 hours, 12 hours. So how does that work out? Well, that, you put your finger on the number one problem. You would never predict you would find trees in a place where it was dark for half the year. You would never make that prediction because trees grow in sunlight. Or you might say, you might say, if it's dark for half the year, maybe you should drop your leaves while it's dark. And so this is an interesting a debate that's going on right now about the origin of deciduousness. You think about a tree that loses leaves, and, and I ask people in the temperate latitudes, why do trees lose their leaves? And I say, well, it's winter. And I say, what about winter makes trees lose their leaves? And they don't answer until they think about it, and they realize that it's hard to get so water it, up the roots. Has anyone done controlled experiment where they take the modern day analogs that lived in the, in the polar regions and su subject them to that kind of light cycle? Yeah, there's a bunch of experiments like that that are happening, at both with different CO2 levels and different light levels. And it's, it's kind of an open argument right now. There's, there's actually a pretty big debate about whether deciduousness originally evolved in the Arctic because of light conditions. And then you think about those forests that are, are deciduous forests. They're here now, they're deciduous. If their ancestors were deciduous because of light conditions, then the modern forest might just persist with that, and they may be pre-adapted to a cold world. Because remember, they lived in a warm world. The reason you're deciduous is in winter, the ground freezes, you don't get water, so you drop your leaves. That's why you were deciduous. In a warm world, why would you be deciduous at mid-latitudes? That's the argument. There's a counter-argument that a leaf, that a tree growing in the Arctic in tough conditions, if it drops the leaves, it has to grow them all back. So, it, so, it's a, maybe it's more conservative just to keep your leaves on even in the dark winter. But that's that's the question, and in my mind, that's one of the big questions. The other big question is, how do you keep it warm enough when the lights are out? I mean, it's a fundamental question for climate models, and and the global climate models have not resolved that yet. And that's what I'm asking all of you to do is to rush back and create new climate models that solve this problem because. We don't understand why the poles are warm in the past. And if we're warming the climate now, one thing we do know is there's a thing called polar amplification, which is it warms much faster in the poles than in the mid-latitudes. And there's some good physics arguments for that, but the question is, you know, what's going to happen to us? If there's dramatic polar amplification, we should see a melting of the Arctic Ocean very rapidly, and we're starting to see evidence of that with the retreat of the floating sea ice. The US Navy just published a study that looks for open sea lanes by 2030 in the Arctic Ocean. So we may live to see, in the next few years, ocean traffic between Rotterdam and Korea. And for that reason, Korea and China are building um, icebreakers right now. So it's a whole new series of issues that are emerging as the polar sea ice melts. And how fast it melts is an open question, which is tied pretty directly to what polar amplification is like. Yeah. Hi, thank you. I don't dig coal. I just prefer to leave it in the ground. But all that coal you mentioned, uh, is, is, as far as you know, is there anybody getting excited about all that? Yeah, you know, there, we just had a letter writing campaign uh, two years ago because people were getting excited about that coal. And obviously, as the ice melts and you can get ships up into the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, people are saying, oh, there's a huge amount of coal in Ellesmere Island. Let's go in and mine that coal. It would be a challenging product because there's, the, the ground is frozen to a depth of a th almost a kilometer there. So they'd be mining frozen coal, permafrost coal. 
But um, there was a it's, a, it's also now part of Nunavut, which is the, the um, First Nations area. And there was a pretty good pushback on that, that opportunity. But as you say, it's, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if the tropical rainforests look substantially different in a much warmer world. You know, the, the, the rainforests that are truly in the tropics. That's a, a really interesting question because when we found the tropical rainforest in Colorado, I started thinking about tropical rainforests. It had never crossed my mind to think about tropical rainforests. I was thinking about polar um, temperate forests. When we found our tropical rainforest, I started doing a literature search to see if I could find what the history of tropical rainforest was. And to me, my amazement, there were no tropical rainforest um, fossil sites that preserved all the characteristics of modern tropical rainforests any earlier than the one in Colorado. And, and I thought, God, that's really interesting. I started thinking about the origins of tropical rainforests. I don't know if you know, look at the map, but in the late Cretaceous, there was a seaway at the equator called the Tethys Sea, because Africa hadn't bumped into Europe yet, and India had not bumped into Asia yet, and Austro Australia New Guinea had not bumped into Malaya yet, and South America had not bumped into North America yet. So you had a seaway that banded around North America. So if you wanted to put a tropical rainforest on the equator in the Cretaceous, you couldn't do it because it was largely water, with the exception of North Africa. Africa was straddling the equator. So we went to Egypt and looked for the equatorial forests in Egypt. And in Baharia Oasis, we found um, forests that weren't tropical rainforests. They were very small leaf dry forests. And one of the predictions of a warm world is the tropics get quite hot and dry. And so you don't get rainforests. And so there is a, a thought that what we call tropical rainforest today first evolved in the wet, w hot mid-latitudes. And as the climate cooled, they migrated back to the equator as the, as the land closed in on it. So it's, it's open terrain in terms of the origin of tropical rainforests. And if you read a textbook and you ask, like, when tropical rainforests form, look closely at it. It's one of those questions we don't really have an answer for. And since many of the tropics are covered in rainforests today, there's not many good fossil sites there right? also. Since we did that work, um, people have discovered good tropical rainforests in Colombia that are younger than the Castle Rock rainforest. They're 60 million, not 64. So it still doesn't resolve the issue of which one came first. You mentioned trees as carbon capturing devices, but you also said that there's um, higher CO2 content during the greenhouse period, and it sounds like more trees as well. Is there no connection between the two? I would think there would be. I mean, I think there's more trees because there's more places that trees can grow because you need moisture and sunlight. So it's, but the question of did they grow faster and bigger is also a question that I don't think we have the data from the fossils to answer that second question. But we can certainly answer the distribution question. So you have to think about a world that really didn't have much in the way of prairies or Arctic tundra. A lot of the, a lot of the modern biomes, I would call ice house biomes, and this greenhouse world had a, a lesser set of greenhouse biomes, mainly forested because of increased temperature. And then the local lack of availability of moisture would give you occasional desert areas or dry areas and probably savanna-like situations. And grasses themselves, which are so important in the world today, don't really get going until the ice house starts. So it's a, it's a really different world than the one we live in today. Well, with that, um, I want to take a moment to invite all of you up to the ninth floor. Um, just get in the elevator and press 9. <laughs> you might get there. <laughs> We're going to have a reception um, where we can all talk to one another and well, it's hurt. <laughs> so thank you.